Eddie Conway, how does it feel to be free? I'm not sure yet. I'm still kind of like getting adjusted to all the stimulation. Uh, I actually haven't slept at all, uh, but I'm enjoying the new environment. <laughs> you must have been shocked yesterday uh, in that nondescript courtroom when the judge announced you were free. Yes. Well, I, I had anticipated that that was going to happen, but until it actually happened, I was not sure what was going to happen. Bob Boyle, can you explain what actually happened and what law was uh, Marshal Eddie Conway freed? Well, um, good morning, Amy, and good morning, Noreen. The, uh, we've actually been trying various legal ways to get Eddie Conway out of prison for many, many years. Uh, some based on the counterintelligence program, on the unfairness of his trial, on ineffective assistance of trial counsel. Um, a few years ago, the, uh, then a few years ago, the Court of Appeals of Maryland held that the jury instructions, which were typically given in trials in the early 1970s, in fact, up until 1980, were unconstitutional. Uh, specifically, the judge told juries back then, and up until 1980, that the jury need not follow the instructions of the court, that the instructions are simply advisory, which means even though the, the judge told the jury that the prosecution had to prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt, for example, he also told the jury, well, you could ignore that instruction, and it's up to you whether to vote um, guilty or not guilty. The, that change in the law, or actually recognition that the instruction was unconstitutional, applied to Eddie Conway's case. And uh, along with Phil Dantes, my co-counsel, we went back to court, as did many other prisoners in the state of Maryland, earlier last year, seeking uh, a new trial on the basis of that. Uh, the motion kind of lingered for the past year, and over the course of the last few months, we uh, reached an agreement with the state's attorney to uh, resentence Mr. Conway to time served. And as a result of that agreement, he was, a re he was released yesterday after, yeah, nearly 44 years in prison, actually 43 years and 11 months. So, Bob Boyle, is this likely, this change in law, is this likely to result in the release of other prisoners in Maryland as well? Well, it, it has already resulted in, in the release of many prisoners in Maryland who, who served um, decades in prison, and, uh, and, and it's continuing. Some have been denied release, um, which for, for some unknown reason. But yes, it, it, it has, and, um, and it also should result in the release of more. Eddie Conway, can you talk about the experience of writing your memoir in prison? What prompted you to do that, and how did you go about doing it while you were imprisoned? Well, I, I think uh, at some point I realized I was getting older, and I realized that I had uh, a lot of experiences and a lot of history of things that had happened. And they hadn't been recorded, and I think they would have been lost uh, to uh, history, and they would have been lessons that had been learned through organizing in prisons that uh, other people could have used. So I think at some point I sat down and I started writing, and I tried to capture what it was that we had tried to do during those turbulent years that George Jackson uh, was organizing in California and uh, Attica occurred uh, in New York, we were trying in the state of Maryland to organize uh, prison labor unions. We were trying to organize uh, uh, education <coughs> seminars, communication seminars. There was no prison uh, uh, library, say, in the penitentiary for 2,000 people. And uh, so there were no books available. So we organized prison, a prison library. Uh, all of those things were like uh, collective organized activities from prisoners on the ground that was an attempt to change the prison system. 
in a way in which would be acceptable, kind of like going down the middle. We wasn't talking about guerrilla warfare, and we wasn't talking about tearing down the prison, but we was trying to make things available for prisoners so that they could improve their lives. That experience, I thought, was going to be lost as I got older and older, so I decided to start writing and wrote it down. And it, uh, my co-author kind of helped me shape it and develop it and whatnot. And uh, so we end up producing that book. And I hope it's something that people can see and learn and understand what we went through. Um, Eddie Conway, can you talk about why you joined the Black Panther Party uh, in the 1960s, and then what happened in 1970? Well, basically, I, I was in Europe. I was a, a sergeant in the Army uh, in Germany, and uh, I had served almost three years. Uh, and they had the ride in Newark, New Jersey. And uh, they put uh, armored personnel carriers in the center of the uh, black community, and they pointed 50 caliber machine guns at um, about 25 or 30 black women standing on the corner. And uh, as I was reading this while I was in Europe, uh, Basically, it said that somebody had broke into the National Guard Armory. Uh, they had came through the community, locked up all the black males in the black community. The women were out there protesting, and they basically called out the National Guard to kind of, like, control that protest. But I looked at the 50 caliber machine gun, and I looked at the armored personnel carrier, and I question what I was doing in Europe. I was on my way to Vietnam. And uh, at that point, I decided to, like, leave the Army, come home, and with the concept that, well, OK, we needed to make some changes in America. America needed some kind of reform. Uh, military vehicles shouldn't be sitting in the middle of the intersection, and 50 caliber machine guns shouldn't be pointed at black women in the black community. And so something was wrong with that picture, and I could probably come home and help join some efforts to kind of reform that. And I joined the NAACP. I joined CORE. Uh, we integrated uh, the Spires Point Bethlehem Steel workplace um, and, uh, and, and basically pressed for some white-collar jobs and whatnot. But in the process of doing all that, I kind of got the sense in America that it was, it was, it, this is like the late 60s. There was a lot of racism going on. There was a lot of organizing going on. There was a lot of uh, activities that uh, were actually just kind of like undermining the efforts that people in the black community was making to improve their, uh, their lot. So as I went on, I realized, I said, well, okay, some more serious kind of organizing need to happen to, to improve the condition of the black community. And I looked at all the different organizations, and the Black Panther Party represented at least a serious attempt to start feeding the children, uh, to start educating the population, to start organizing health care and stuff like that. So I joined, I started working with them. Uh, and I didn't discover until later on that the chapter was organized by a national security agent and police informers and so on. But uh, we did that kind of work, and in the process of doing that kind of work, I think the, some of the most active people in the organization was targeted, followed around by the uh, COINTELPRO, and uh, opportunities were created with agent provocateurs or either uh, police informers or even just incidents were created that ultimately led to them destroying, like, 25 of our 37 state chapters uh, in a period of 18 months. And they locked up the, uh, the primary leadership, all the national leadership, or they chased them out of the country, and then they started focusing on the secondary leadership. At that time, I was considered part of the secondary leadership. And they pretty much locked us up or framed some of us or chased some of us out of the country. And, um, and they used an incident in Baltimore where 
uh, two Black Panthers uh, were arrested in the uh, aftermath of a police shooting in which one policeman died and a couple of us were wounded. And they used that uh, to lock me up. And they locked me up and pretty much uh, put an informer in my cell and used that to justify them holding me in the prison system. They uh, stacked the deck in terms of my photograph in uh, two different sets of uh, uh, photographs. Mine was the only one duplicated. Um, they, uh, we actually, we took that to the Supreme Court and challenged it. We challenged some other things. But by the time we found out that COINTELPRO was uh, out there and operating, pretty much the Black Panther Party had been destroyed. Mm -hmm.